All right, good. I get to start things just like it's class. <laughs> good afternoon, yes, and it feels like class, so good to see so many of you again. Um, I am going to have my challenges with this recording device, which I can't attach to me because I don't have guy clothes on, frankly, and um, I, if I carry it around, I can't do all my uh, gestures, so we'll see. It'll probably go flying around. That'll be part of the entertainment. Uh, so, Chicago Best Ideas. This is an audacious title. I think about some of the other ideas, like, you know, Coase Theorem and Common Law Constitutionalism. But even this week, I think, there have been other ideas that uh, are... Um, Surely better than what I have to say, because I'm not sure, I'm sure this is not my best idea, even my best idea. Um, what it is, is a persistent idea. It's an idea that I can't shake off. And uh, part of what I want to talk about today is you know, how I think about what scholarship, what work is uh, most worth doing. You know, what is the value added generally of legal scholarship? Something we should think about from now on. If we can get very carried away with things we love to think about, and we have to sort of stop and say, this is fun, but what, what are we doing with this? How is this valuable? Um, and particularly, personally, what is my value added? What, do, how, what, what it, does it make most sense for me to spend my scholarly, en scholarly energies uh, doing? And, and you'll hear, as, as I talk and as we have a chance to, to discuss, um, that this is a project that really presses that question. It repeatedly presses the question for me. Um, what does it make sense for me to be doing? Is this something that makes sense for me to be doing? But I can't shake it off, and, I, and, and you'll get a sense of that um, uh, as, I, as I talk. I'm going to say a little bit about my background, because I think it's relevant for this question of how we think about value added and how we make those choices. Some of you know my path to academia was not typical, even when I followed it, which was now almost 20 years ago. Um, it would almost be impossible to follow my path and end up in academia today, I think, sort of sadly, uh, to, to some extent. Um, I clerked for a couple of years, a couple of different clerkships after law school, and then I just wanted to flee the ivory tower. I wanted to be a real lawyer for real clients, and they were going to have problems that the law could help them solve, and I, as a lawyer, was going to help them do that. I was particularly interested um, in working with people who are living in poverty and the particular set of issues um, surrounding their lives that I think the law had a lot to say about. Um, and so that's what I did. I went to legal aid, and I worked to, at legal aid for two years, and then I went from legal aid to the juvenile law center. And what I ended up, I sort of became a specialist in that process, and I ended up specializing on, uh, in the area of law, addressing uh, young people, children and adolescents involved in state systems, so children whose Parents were accused of abuse, abuse and neglect, children in, in various special education programs, and kids in the juvenile justice system as well. Um, and the way the path sort of started pulling, pulling me um, back into uh, the academy is I started getting interested in writing things that you know, had questions, and I look for things, and people seem to not yet be talking about them in a way that I thought would be worthwhile to talk about. Um, and so I really started writing where I was living. I wrote about ethical issues surrounding the representation of children, which got me interested in child development. Um, and this sort of gradually, you know, I sort of developed a, a broader interest in the law affecting uh, children in particular, which leads to things like family law generally and the rights, the relationship between parents and children. But I stayed interested particularly in thinking about the state as, you know, an actor contributor in shaping children's development. So that's relevant in contexts as broad as you know, thinking about educational requirements and when is it appropriate to intervene uh, in regulating how parents raise their children. And of course, in the juvenile justice system, what kinds of responses is appropriate for society uh, to, uh, to, um, to engage in in response to juvenile criminal offending. Uh, so um, that, and, and some of the work I've done is very, you know, sort of classically doctrinal. I sort of analyze the Constitution, and I love doing that kind of work. But a lot of my work has pulled me in the direction of child development, and I'm particularly interested in thinking about uh, the developmental effect of young people's experience with the law and the legal process, right? So how the actual engagement with the law, or how the law treats them, how they experience the law shapes them um, as they grow up. And it's in that context that this sort of project um, uh, developed. Um, so, 
The project has a theoretical foundation. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, but a piece of it is very much feels like I'm in my old world of reform advocacy, right? And so this is basically a project that I see as having three phases. There's the kind of hat firmly on, make the sort of theoretical arguments. Uh, and I'm going to get into the content in, in just a moment. And then hats off. This is actually the stage I'm in right now, which is engaging the world and trying to uh, convince judges to try something that is not yet um, out there so that I can eventually hat back on, uh, study, are we finding the kinds of things we would, that the theory would suggest uh, we would find. Excuse me. So the, the basic idea stated overly simply uh, is, is this. Um, so, so a lot of social scientific um, and other uh, theoretical foundation for, supports the idea that young people's experience with the court process, and I'm focusing on juvenile court, and that means experience of the process itself, how they are treated in the process, how they perceive the process, um, at, that that experience likely has a developmental effect, which could be positive or could be negative depending on what that experience is. Okay, that's a sort of theoretically supported idea, that, there should, that there, we have reason to think that there is this developmental connection. Now, if you look out in the world, there's a kind of a way things are done in the juvenile court. Um, it doesn't allow for a natural experiment. You know, this is one way to do it, and here's another way to do it, and do we see a positive or a negative effect, and how does it vary? Because there's basically one way of doing it, and the, you know, if you look at the theoretical groundings, the way that it's done suggests hazard, developmental hazard. Um, so that's where the hats off part comes. It's like there's not a natural experiment. I want to create the natural experiment. I want to develop a pilot or maybe a couple pilots uh, where we can try some things out. Judge, you know, a judge would, would try a different way um, in order to then sort of t uh, test whether that's, um, whether it would have the developmental value um, that uh, one would predict it would. Okay, so let me sort of fill in and give you some, give you some content. Um, the, the, base, the, the basis of the project, there's a, there's a legal foundation, there's a science, social scientific foundation, there's a, what I call sort of the observed reality aspect of the foundation, and then there's a, and then there's a, a sort of an opportunity, illustrative models um, that, are, that come from other contexts that I think are an important piece of thinking through the issues. So I'll say more about each of those. The first is the law, right? Okay, so we're focused on Juvenile justice system, meaning the system that uh, governs uh, the response to young people's minors uh, criminal offending. So we have a targeted group, adolescents who commit crime, right? But it's actually more targeted than that because many uh, young offenders, if they are particularly young or their crimes are thought to be uh, particularly um, trivial, comparatively trivial, if they're first offenders and the like, the system increasingly keeps them out of the court process altogether on the view that there are a lot of, there's a lot of harm that comes to being engaged in that process at all. So the targeting is more precise than just adolescents that commit crime. If you're younger, if you're engaged in less serious crime, if you are white, you're, there are many things where you're more likely to be screened out of this process altogether. Whether it's the informal station adjustment where the police officer you know, talks harshly to you in the front of your parents, or whether you go into a program called a diversionary program that is, you know, it's a system all to itself, but it's a system uh, that's committed to shielding you from uh, the, the, the more serious uh, court process. So that's sort of the, the targeting on the one side. On the other side, uh, the targeting uh, clears out uh, those who are defined as the most serious and the oldest, right? Some of the most serious oldest offenders are tried in the adult court, right? Um, so we're talking about what is the group that remains in the juvenile justice system, uh, serious offenders, sort of where society in, is still willing to invest to try to help them grow up to be you know, sort of successful um, uh, law-abiding and pro-social adults, right? So the idea is it's a process that has among its identified aims not only holding the young people accountable and keeping the community safe, but an important pillar, always has been part of the juvenile justice system, uh, the aim of helping people to grow up, right? It's, pro it's a pillar that is distinctly missing from the adult system, 
we invest, we show through our law the special commitment to young people who are targeted for this court process. And I think that's a relevant piece of the story. The target population, high risk, where society is still saying we're still committed to doing what we can to, um, to, to avoid, avoid the hazard um, that, it, that we're facing. OK, now the social science. A lot of different pieces to the social science. Part of it is just the, the story of adolescent development. Right? So the basic projects of adolescent development include uh, basically, you know, well, by the time you're in mid-adolescence, your basic cognitive functioning is much like an adult. But you need practice to learn to do it well. Right? The fact that you have all the machinery to sort of weigh costs and benefits and all that doesn't mean you know how to use it well, whether it's social emotional issues associated with that and also experientially to sort of understanding what it means uh, to make decisions, to, to live by decisions, to sort of update decisions, to live responsibly as a decision maker over your own lives. Lots of support to suggest an important piece of late adolescence. Later adolescence is really getting that practice in supportive context, right? You need adults around you who care about you in contexts that matter to you to get practice doing this thing that we count on adults doing well. And many adults don't do well, and we can usually trace it back and say, you know, it would have been nice if they had had a little more of the right kind of experience and support and learning how to do it well while they sort of still had that chance. The other big project of mid to late adolescence and early adulthood is identity development. So part of that is, who am I as an individual? What do I care about? What are my values? You know, but it, there's a huge social component as well. With whom do I belong? Who are my meaningful affiliations? Who cares about me? Whose rules do I care about following, right? Who, whose memberships? You know, what are the memberships that matter to me? And in what communities does my membership matter, right? Um, so those two big background pieces, oh, and everybody develops social identity. It's just a question of what it is. <laughs> so we understand the hazard is it's going to develop in a direction that traps people in, uh, in, 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 a, in a definition of themselves as parts of communities that will put them at odds with our, our system of, of, of laws as, as adults. Um, OK, so that's, you know, we all go through. That, that, that's standard. That's every, every adolescent is, is engaging in those uh, projects. Another piece of the social science is draws from the social psychologists and their focus on procedural justice. Some of you have probably encountered this in what, one class or another, a very extensively studied phenomenon that mostly studied of adults, so now, now increasingly studies of children as well, but studies of adults um, capturing the fact that their experience in court or in other court, uh, contexts in which they engage with law enforcement, like with the police, um, <laughs> How they experience, their, how they're treated, how they experience that process materially affects their perception of whether the law is legitimate or not, and, and therefore their sense of whether they have any um, you know, commitment and obligation to obey the law. This may sound like, yeah, okay, that seems sort of straightforward. On one hand, it's straightforward, and the other hand, it's pretty striking that it's been tested again and again, and even where outcomes are identified as negative, it was, you know, more important for people's understanding of whether they've been treated fairly and therefore whether they have this um, obligation to obey the law is tied with this experience of treatment. Whether they look at, whether people experience themselves as respected, whether they have a meaningful opportunity to do, actually engage in the decision-making process, uh, whether decision-makers and the decision-making process are perceived as fair, right? All those things obviously inter, uh, interconnected. Okay, so. Procedural justice, as I mentioned, not studied very much for children yet. And when it is studied, it tends to be described as, as um, legal socialization, really, I think, capturing very much a common idea. But the idea is it's sort of more developmentally focused. We're thinking more about sort of what shapes a person growing up, to what socializes them, where do those, where do those effects uh, come from. And of course, you can think about how, you know, it's pretty, I think, easy to see the connection between going, the, the relevance of the legal socialization process generally broader inquiry about social identity development. You know, when you're being legally socialized, you're learning something about where you fit in this community that makes laws and enforces laws, right? Obviously, very, very important question for young people in the juvenile justice system who are identified as at the highest risk of making different choices about their, or, um, or developing in different ways in terms of their uh, social, social identity that will have really important impact for them. OK. Um, so. The social science suggests it, um, it can make a difference, can be developmentally make a difference for young people, what their experience is. If 
we think there's anything to that, if we're convinced by that social science, we should be very worried about what's going on uh, in juvenile court. Now here I switch gears from my uh, social science and the sort of underlying legal definition of who's in court and, and rely on observation. And I have to sort of say that it's very hard, I think, to capture in words what is impossible to miss if you engage in actual observation in juvenile court. You're watching in juvenile court and thinking about, sort of, what am I learning about how this is being experienced? It's a kind of, I think it's a devastating um, uh, uh, experience to, to go through that. And I know there, there's at least one person, I see maybe others who, have, who were involved in my seminar last year and who did these, co these court observations and maybe will have a chance to um, say something uh, the, themselves about how they've experienced it. But I think it's a, pretty universal reaction. If you go to court and you observe for this purpose, you're not thinking about like, what do I learn about what kind of outcome they did? Was that judge a kind person or whatever else? But how is this being experienced by this young person? If you think it makes any difference developmentally, how it's experienced, you should be very troubled by what you see. Now I want to emphasize, this is in the context, I'm, I'm assuming a very conscientious judge, a conscientious set of lawyers. I mean, it's easy to tell a horror story about the really bad cases where the lawyer, judge doesn't care and the lawyer doesn't show up and, right, you know, there, there are worse cases. I'm talking about the good cases, right? So what I'm talking about is a deeper sort of systemic issue, not an issue about whether the people in the room care or want to do the right thing or, or support uh, the young people in the system in, in a sort of a, in a, in a general sense. So I'm going to try to do a little bit to capture what you see, but I won't say a lot because it's just impossible, I think, to really do it justice in, in words. There, there are a couple aspects. One is actually social. And this is something, when you talk to young people who've been in the courts, it's one of the first things they say. If you go to court, it's one of the first things you notice, which is the, you know, lots and lots of cases in juvenile court. And I'm talking particularly in an urban setting where you have court, designated courts where all they do all day is hear juvenile justice cases. They have a long list of cases, a number of professionals who are sitting in the room more or less all day. They're a prosecutor, there's a defender. Um, they take each other's cases because they're managing big caseloads. So you have like one defender who's got a big stack of cases and the prosecution's got, got the same stack of cases. And there are a couple probation officers, maybe one handling other people's cases. Um, and, um, someone who might have done clinical assessments who's there. You're going to have the sheriff. And then you're going to have a couple court personnel who sort of in charge of the paperwork. And they hang out with each other all day in court. And as it's, it may be it's sort of, a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, if you watch the dynamic, it's this intense social we're hanging out all day together, dynamic. Like if you were sitting there as a court observer, you, you get to stay into court, court, court you know, between hearings and people are called and they leave. So you see this dynamic. They're flirting with each other, they're joking, they're making plans, you know, all this stuff is going on. Like they're this friendly group. And I guess part of it is heartening because they do this every day, you know, they, they're good friends. But then sort of enter, you know, the case is called and in comes a young person and often with a family. Everything about the experience is, I'm outside this, you guys are the group, I'm being disregarded and often disrespected. I don't mean people are saying insulting things to them, it's just like the, the sense is not, here's the person about whom this is about, and this is juvenile court, so a central aim of what we're doing is sorting out, how do we help you? Because it is a central aim, articulated in all the juvenile laws. That is completely invisible to the young person. And again, part of this is a social dynamic. But then moving on to the content. Big piles of cases, they do this every day. It's tremendously routinized, it's tremendously hurried. All decisions have either been made before, most of them have, or there's one more, th one thing to be decided, all this regular, re the relevant content for the decision is essentially either delivered to the court in paper form, completely invisible uh, to the young person, or it's sort of reduced to a, you know, five quick sentences with a bunch of initials because the judge has seen it many times before, and okay, I get it, it's a, this issue. So, the young person has no sense of what's going on. And that's not quite fair. They have an inaccurate sense. They think that what's going on is just what, they've seen it on TV. They did something that's against the law. Now they're being punished, and their punishment includes this, that, and the other thing. That's not wrong, but it's only a piece of the story. There's this other whole thing that's going on, which is this assessment of where are you, what do we need, how do we support you? And that is completely invisible. Now, many people place a lot of emphasis on whether the young person gets to talk. I cringe the most when the young person has a chance to talk, and here's why. Uh, first of all, many times, maybe very uh, shrewdly, or you know, for whether it shows wisdom or not, the young person opts out. Whether they're intimidated, whether they're angry, whether they understand it's a complete waste of time, 
lots of times they say, you know, no, I don't want to talk. But when they do want, then they do choose to talk, and sometimes they have, really have some things to say, there's this sense of them being patiently waited out. I mean, I think that's the best way to describe it. People are nice, they want to serve as friendly faces, um, but it doesn't make one bit of difference for what happens. Sometimes after they talk, there's a little comment made about what they said. Might be supportive, might be like, da, 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 you can't do that until you do this or whatever. But whatever it is, it doesn't move, it doesn't change anything that happens going forward. It certainly doesn't in any way affect what would be understood by anyone as any decision that's being made uh, in, in the courtroom. So I could go on and on, and I would continue to feel ineffective at really capturing what you just kind of have to see to really get, uh, but I think it's very clear that these young people are not experiencing anything that you would call procedural justice in their proceedings. So if you put together the suggestion that that might really matter developmentally with what we see actually playing out again and again, and I've observed in many courtrooms over many years uh, in many contexts, um, we, you know, there's something to be worried about, right? We should think that the message that young people are getting is I'm outside this system, this system. It's the personification of law. It's this judge that comes out and, and acts out the law in this kind of theater of the courtroom. The message of the theater of the courtroom is outside, alienated, and often, add to that, racialized, right? They're in a big urban um, court like Cook County. A number of the professionals are African American or Latino. Many are white. All of the offenders are African American or Latino. So, you know, what do you think a 14-year-old, a 16-year-old, a 17-year-old uh, gets from that experience? Um, we think it has any developmental effect at all. It is a negative, anti-socializing, alienating developmental effect. That's the argument. Okay. So, if you, so then, the idea, then the question would be, well, why do we think there's any way to do it any better? You know, maybe we just have nobody in court. By the way, that's a big part of the message. And I think that the, the, the world has moved well in recognizing that many people you know, do better to keep them out of court altogether. We are not in a world where we're going to eliminate juvenile court or say for all minors, you know, we're going to keep you out of the court process altogether. It's not going to happen for these most serious offenders. If they're not a, a, a transferred to adult court, an even worse fate, right? If they're still in this system of hope and support, they're still going to be the court. And it seems to me if anybody should get the benefits that might come with um, you know, what we've learned about what makes a difference. It should be those young people who are identified as at the greatest risk. So what can we learn from models outside the court system to suggest it might make a difference? I have three different kinds of models I want to point to, and they all have something to say, but they're all different in some respect or another from the juvenile court. One is these diversionary programs that I already talked about, right? So there are a huge number of programs that have been developed. Some have been pretty extensively studied. Um, where young people are not in court, but they go through some kind of a process where they engage in decision making about what should be the consequences of their offending. Many of these under the umbrella of restorative justice, right? A kind of conferencing where uh, young people have a very central role, centrally engaged in decision making. Very often the victim with a community of support is also there, uh, but the idea is they are centrally involved in this process of reflection and planning uh, going forward from the offense. Um, another category is treatment courts, which have been mostly developed in the context of, of adults. You may have heard about some of these courts. Or some of them are the most sort of famous models are the drug courts and the mental health courts. The idea behind these courts is they're courts where uh, it's still court and there's still a judge with all the authority of the judge, which means they can bring resources to bear and they can also impose consequences. Um, but they're focused on uh, people who have been uh, convicted where the understanding is the underlying problem is some, you know, some kind, we should be getting at the pr underlying problem. So they're drug addicted, uh, they have mental illness, and the focus of the court is on helping them deal with those underlying problems. So that's another, that's another model. I think there's a real variety in what that model has demonstrated, uh, but the, the programs that are said to be most successful are ones where there's a lot of ongoing involvement between the judge and the, the individuals involved. Um, so the third model is actually from within the juvenile court, but it's from the child welfare side, right? So all juvenile courts, they have a child welfare, that's the abuse and neglect system uh, side, and a juvenile justice, a criminal side. It's interesting, historically, it used to all be blended together. The idea is these are kids who need help, and we should, uh, we, there should be a special court for kids who need help. Gradually, over time, the juvenile justice and the child welfare 
systems have separated. Um, and in the big jurisdictions, like a place like Chicago, separate judges hear the different cases. It's all the same courthouse, though, if you've been there. Um, in the, on the child welfare side, for the oldest foster youth, so these are kids who are going to age out of foster care. They're not going back to their families of origin. They're not going to be adopted. Uh, a very sort of innovative judge in Chicago said, there's a, I, there's a different way to do this. For her reviews, the, the foster kids come in for regular reviews. Um, she started, she just totally changed how she did these reviews. And she started having a one-on-one -on -one engagement with young people, very focused on their planning, short and long-term planning, could bring those judicial resources to bear to sort of make things happen to support the child, invested the time with frequent hearings just to really establish a relationship uh, with those young people. The, I don't actually know how they got the name Benchmark Hearings, but they were named the Benchmark Hearings. The Benchmark Hearings continue in Cook County and have now been picked up in a number of other jurisdictions, but all on the child welfare side of things. So one of the ways I sort of frame as I've started to talk to judges, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a second, is maybe the simplest way of capturing what I'm proposing someone try is basically a benchmark model for a youth in the juvenile, in the juvenile justice system. This is for a dispositional phase, not for adjudicating guilt. But when we're at the stage of deciding what happens now and then reviewing those, that, that, that planning process, uh, the idea is you know, there's th that, that importing something like the benchmark proceedings, where there's a one-on-one -on -one engagement between the young person uh, and the judge, frequent hearings, um, an opportunity to engage in actual decision making in the court. So all those things that are usually done and sort of fleshed out in a probation report or fleshed out in the kind of standard operating procedure have to be actually laid out and discussed in sort of clear view of with full engagement of the young person in court. That's the basic idea. One of the reasons I sometimes say what is my value added is at some level it is the most basic simple idea. Like when I sort of, you know, if I jump right into that, what are you doing? It's like, Okay, yeah, good idea. Like judges should spend time with it. Um, it's hard to, you know, the, 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 so, so, so what's the value added? The value added is despite what in some ways seems sort of intuitive about why this might be a good idea, with a lot of social science to back up the idea that actually in a lot of other close contexts they've studied this and it really makes a difference in how people, you know, that experience and how they grow up. We have, as far as I know, zero models, zero, two zeros models uh, of, of this actually occurring. So. What's my value added? I can kind of push the social science. I now have you know, things, like, things I've written that I can send off to the judges, back it up to say, try this. I just want you to try a pilot. How about 10 juveniles, 10 young people, one judge, do it long enough, engage in this different way that we can start studying. And originally, when it's, the, the, or, you know, okay, so hats off. I'm looking around. This is what I'm doing. I'm talking to judges now. It's actually really fun. Uh, but it's like, you know, two judges in Pomona, California. I got off the map. It's like, that would not be the most efficient way <laughs> to do this. But, you know, <laughs> one judge in Missouri who's already doing benchmarks. I'm really interested in that model. You're already doing benchmarks. You sort of, you get it. You have to have a certain aptitude to, to be doing those kind of hearings. Um, you know, Tennessee has been identified as a promising state. It's like, who knows where I might um, uh, end up. But the idea is to start recognizing that we have to start with some soft science. Um, getting some information about how this is experienced. The other, the parallel piece is uh, that we're developing uh, is, uh, we means me and a couple students, um, uh, is a survey instrument that we can um, use with young people who are going through the traditional system so that there's a rough, soft, recognizing it's soft, com comparison we might be able to start drawing. Of course, the big ambitions way down the line, hat firmly back on, would be to ultimately Say that there's a, you know, convince people there's enough there that some jurisdiction will be willing to do a more controlled study where we have two groups that sort of otherwise, you know, look the same who get these these different uh, treatments. But that's, you know, if that happens, it's years off, and it shouldn't happen if I don't have some kind of success with a pilot that suggests there's something meaningful to keep chasing here. Just because I think this is a good idea, just because it's the idea I can't shake off, at some point I have to shake it off if I don't sort of through this process, this intermediate process, start seeing something that I can point to and convince a jurisdiction is worth uh, taking note of that goes beyond the, the, the kind of underlying theory that makes this the idea that I can't shake off. So that's where I am. Thoughts? Comments? <laughs> Comments, questions. I was told to leave lots of time for comments and questions, which is how I like it. So, yeah. 
can you talk a little bit more about what the, what this, what the benchmark hearing process would look like? Um, in yeah, I, I zipped through that pretty so quickly. Sort of like, is, to is it yeah. an adversarial process? Well, well that's one of the most interesting, that's one of the most contentious things, I think, for people who would need to sign on, is that um, the role of the lawyer is much diminished. Okay, so there are a few things to say about that. The idea is, you know, lawyering, I've spent a lot of time thinking about and some time writing about and a decent amount of time reading about thinking, you know, lawyers for young people. And the challenge, of course, is in a system without lawyers, there can be all of the issues that face adults, the vulnerabilities of adults can just be magnified, right? So lawyers play an incredibly important role in ensuring that the system does what it's required to do on behalf of, of, of young people. So anytime the suggestion is we should have a court process where lawyers back off is something that one should be, you know, very, very careful about. And there's some, some particular things to say about kids in the juvenile justice system, which I want to say. It's a, so so I, I hear that concern. I think it's a really important uh, concern. It is why I am focused, it's no, one of two main reasons, the other is because it makes sense in terms of the content, on the dispositional phase. Right? The idea is I, I am not advocating taking lawyers out of a system that's trying cases. Right? There's just absolutely no way, I think. We're nowhere close. Maybe someday. You know, it was the original vision of the juvenile court is that everybody would be so caring and it's all about helping. So we don't really need lawyers. We don't even need those trappings. The judge will be really nice. He'll be like your uncle and he'll uh, lean over and you know, be very, give, give you kindly advice and we'll all be you know, better people. It's like what happened is, you know, Kids went to jails, except they didn't call them jails, and nobody was paying any attention. They had no protections, and it was, you know, just it was a, it was a system that that did very badly by um, by young people. Not surprisingly, it's sort of very resource stretched, and nobody quite knows, you know, it's, it's easier to be punitive than figure out how to actually pu help people and many other things. So we now have a host of constitutional protections um, for young people, and which I completely support the idea that they need to have their um, uh, their rights. Uh, Firmly, zealously uh, safeguarded. So, what? How is? So, why is it not just as risky at the dispositional phase to pull lawyers out of this? And I think you can make a little bit of an analogy to the child welfare context here too. Um, one piece you would have to have in place would be you, there'd have to be an evidentiary protection. Those of you who haven't taken, if you're taking evidence in the spring, you'll learn this soon. If you've already taken it, you know that there are areas, uh, there are statements made in certain contexts that we that cannot be used as evidence in order, because we want to incentivize people to have these uh, conversations and because uh, they're going to say, you know, the conversations would be full of exactly the kind of, uh, of, of evidence that a party might want to use against you. So classically, settlement negotiations and discussions, a lot of sub rules on this one, connected with plea agreements, right? So the idea is, if you want to encourage people to engage in these conversations, you have to promise them that if the settlement doesn't work out, right, the plea doesn't end up getting entered, this stuff can't be used against them, right? Kind of makes sense. You want that to happen, you got to provide some protection. You'd have to have something like that in place. You'd have to, because otherwise it would be, you know, stilted and guarded and lawyers would have to jump in. It would be crazy not to have lawyers. If the young people, how do you talk about your life and your plans for the future in any kind of meaningful way that might not, you know, that might bump up against something or other that, that, that a prosecutor might say, you know, what's that? What's that? Is that, isn't that person a member of a gang? That are, right. So, so that's a key piece. It, it, it can't work in the juvenile justice system unless the, the, the communications are protected. But let me say the flip side of it is that a lot of people, and I think that uh, Brooke would say sort of the, the, the first instinct when you confront this issue, um, maybe particularly as a law student or as a lawyer, is you got to get better lawyers doing more stuff on behalf of these kids. That's, that's the right answer. And here's why I think that's not the right answer. Um, I, I mean, I'm all for lawyers, and I'll say more about this. Absolutely a, a very, very important role left for zealous lawyering. But the reason I think just saying we need lawyers to do a better job is not the answer is because um, a lot, it goes into this social dynamic. This is only a piece of it, but it's the part I want to focus on here, which is if you're a repeat player in a courtroom, day after day, this is my group. If you want to be effective for your clients, this client even, but certainly all your other clients, you don't throw a huge wrench in the system and make everybody behave like, slow down, we're going to have to talk about all this in court. And like, what are you guys? Like? I mean, I, I, I mean you, you may have experienced, I mean, you, have, uh, uh, you may have had some of this experience yourself. I have definitely had this experience when I used to be in 
in practice in the same kind of setting where a lot of people were seeing, you know, repeat players, seeing each other all day and day. You make this calculation about how much you're willing to push against the very, very entrenched dynamic of the place for good reasons. You know that it could have a lot of harmful effects on your own ability to be effective. So I just don't think the kind of the dramatic change I'm talking about, and what am I talking about, really slowing things down, really engaging substantively every aspect that goes into this assessment of how do we sort out what do you need, what does it mean, what is your plan, you know, how do we help you think through that. Um, you have to, you, it just, it's unrealistic to think that a lawyer in the position in these courtrooms is ever going to do that beyond, you know, little bits and little sort of nibbles on the outside. Whereas judges, you know, judges, for better and for worse, they, they're little, little emperors, right? I mean, they, you know, they, they really can. I mean, it's, it can be really for worse, right? But, um, uh, but they can do things radically differently. They can just decide, I get what's, why this might be valuable. I can do something really different. And people will still complain, like, I can't believe it. Oh, like, I thought I was going to have lunch today. Oh. But, you know, that there's, there, so what, right? It's the judge. They're still going to do it. So I think it's not, the kind of change I'm talking about is, is too big. It's too different to expect it to be driven by lawyers. The other thing I'll just quickly mention is it's complicated. If, if part of what you're doing is helping young people learn to actually engage in decision making, sort of to take that role, it, it, I, I don't think you can do it if, if you have someone talking for you. It's just that's, too, that's, that's the familiar role of the child, right? People talk for me. Sometimes I agree, sometimes I don't. Mostly I tune them out. So much tuning out. It's like I have two, I have two kids. I was like, oh, I, so many times, I'm like, what happened to that? I don't know, I wasn't really paying attention. Why weren't you paying attention? These are my own children, right? So, um, but, but in a context where it's, it, it feels like an, a, you know, it feels sort of assaultive and uncomfortable, you're really inclined to tune it out. So I think the danger is that you really, this, I, this model of representation where you really have a voice through your lawyer, very circumscribed. But the one thing I'd add, and I've spent a lot of time on that one question, I want to have time for more questions, but is just that there's a huge role for the lawyers. The lawyers are part of what makes the process really achieve, like, you know, what is it, you know, the, the, there's a huge amount of preparing for these hearings so that the young person really can get value out of them. And then there's making sure things happen, right? So everybody in the courtroom, people have responsibilities. Agencies are supposed to provide services and, and, and various other kinds of support. If a lawyer is not keeping on top of that, it's not going to happen. So they, yeah. So in terms of just trying to get a sense of what it, what it looks like, so, I mean, so the judge, her or himself, isn't generally in a position to know about all the services and everything out th that's out there, et cetera. So are there roles of social workers, probation officers, in, in terms of, I mean, how? Yeah, what so this sure. I mean, there are roles for all those people who would otherwise be involved. But I think that one can sometimes overrate the value of kind of the, the I mean, clearly, sometimes there are particular services you need to be able to, um, to tap into. And that's true, whatever model we're talking about. But some of it is just paying attention to a set of goals and thinking about sort of, and, and staying on top of those set of goals. And it's not a complicated uh, set of things that needs to be done on the outside. Just someone, there just needs to be follow through that's almost always missing. And there's follow through in part because two, three weeks later, you're back in court, you're talking to the judge again about where things are. Yeah. This seems very analogous to me to drug courts and the emergency. Which is one of the ones I yeah. quickly yeah. mentioned so that, yeah. I, I want to know exactly what, like, in trying to propose this to a judge, to what extent do you think that would, like using that model to try to convince them to do it would help? And what are some similarities and differences? Okay, so, um, so in, in the piece that I'm sending to judges, it's one of like I go through the different models and I say this is what we can learn from this model, this is what's different, that might be different, you know, and, and drug courts are one of the things. The thing about drug courts, I, I think there are a couple, um, in a very general sense, it's, it's a great analogy because the judge is still very much exercising the authority of the judge with a radically changed relationship aimed at figuring out a way to be supportive and helpful. Okay, so that that's suggests to the extent that judges say, oh, judges don't do that kind of thing. I mean, judges, there are some judges in these, um, these specialized courts that have really um, you know, done amazing things, and I think clearly their role as a judge makes a difference. Um, here are some important differences. I, mean, I think two important differences that I'd highlight. One is one of the ways that those work is they're, they're mostly done as a group. It's like, you know, it's like a 20 people in court together who all have a, a drug problem. And the idea is that sort of part of the idea is you get a peer support. There may be a value to that. Uh, but it's a very sort of public process in a way that I think 
many people would say. So our in intuition is that may not be appropriate for, for young people. And they're also sort of, the, the treatment model is we, you all have this problem. It's sort of, we think it actually helps you to understand that you're sort of embracing this single problem together. That's not, that, that's, I mean, that's, that's what we don't, we don't want, you know, juvenile court is not, you, you guys are all delinquent, right? So the idea is actually engaging with them as individuals. So the individual versus group uh, distinction, and with it, the particularity of what it means to address needs and be supportive of future plans, I think, looks different. Yes? Um, how do you envision sort of dealing with what you touched on a little bit about, like these huge caseloads and lack of resources and, and that sort of thing? with this benchmark model. <coughs> right, that's one of the only good things to be said about a really tiny pilot. It's like one thing at a time. Let's see if it actually makes a difference, right? I mean, you know, at some level, any program that's gonna be effective at helping people who have had lives of very challenging circumstances and find themselves at 16 or 17 having been arrested and convicted of serious crimes, it's like we either are willing to invest some resources or it's all a sham. Right? I mean, what are we doing? It's like we're just sort of a holding pattern, just sort of hope it works out. I mean, it's not a crazy idea to say some people just grow out of things, like cross our fingers and just like say we're just sort of keeping you out of the system for a couple more years. But the idea of the system goes beyond that. It says we're serious about trying to figure out how to help you. And um, that's going to take some resources. But the, the short, cheaty answer is to say you don't go that far until you can make the case that there's some reason to think it can make a difference. And of course, if you, have the, if you can make the case that it can, the, that it can make a difference, you always have the very helpful fact that adult incarceration is extremely expensive, right? So compared to what, right? So the idea is if there's some reason to think this could make a difference, um, and, and you've noticed, I haven't focused on recidivism rates, but it's obviously would be a piece of the story. I just, I don't like it to be about, this is what it takes to keep people from committing crimes. Like the deeper developmental story is this, there might be some potential to change people's understanding of um, you know, how they fit into the society that enforces law, but uh, but the bottom line is, you know, it ought to also have some some cost implications that are positive along the way. But that's many steps down the road. Of course. Uh, I'm curious, as you've approached judges, what their reactions have been, and if they've had hesitations, what they've been about. Yeah, so I've really, you know, just started having these conversations, and it's interesting because part of it is I'm getting. Take, you know, I'm finding people who are go more likely to be receptive in some way or another, but I think in some ways you don't really test it until you're saying, okay, here we are, and now we're starting the pilot, and then you can say, oh, look how much we thought we understood, right? So one of the things that I'm finding when we talk about skill sets one does or doesn't have, because this is not something I really do, is, is I mean, I've done in the past, is, you know, how do you make sure the judges really understand? And this is why I've increasingly become interested in focusing on the, bench, the judges who are already doing benchmarks, because I think there's only so much confidence I can have, no matter how much literature I send, or how much time I spend on the phone, or how many other people I have helping me by talking, like I have some people I've talked to because they know the judge better, and so, there's still a lot of room. I mean, how many times I've had some conversation like this and people say, yeah, I really, I see what you're saying, and then go on to repeat back to me something that's focused on various kinds of juvenile justice programming that may be really terrific, but have nothing to do with the court process, right? So um, it's a really important question, and I, I would say, you know, the proof is in the pudding, but I think part of, is, is the thinking of ways where I can t rely on what they already know some other way is gonna be crucial. That's why I sort of, like, I, I didn't start out this, with this at all, but then I started thinking, you know, maybe I should really be focused on these judges who already do this in the child welfare context. There's also a selection process for the right judge, because you know you can have a really concerned, excellent judge who's just actually not good at spending you know hours on a regular basis talking to a young person with whom they feel like they don't have very much in common, and that's a big waste of everybody's time. It's not going to work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Kind of going off Hannah's question, I was wondering at what sorts of measures you're going to be looking at afterwards, and understanding yeah. not wanting to focus on race versus. Okay, so this is really like the pie in the sky. The pilot comes through. It works. I study it. So, so the idea would be the earliest version, this is what I envision, is actually very much about the experience. So it, it would not be able to assess, like the earliest version would be too short a period, whether it actually changes, you know, development, right? It would be looking at the experience itself and trying as much as possible to look for the kinds of factors that have been found to be re relevant in the procedural justice context. So that's the first stage. It's, interviews with the young person um, 
and then you know matched up with the, the interviews of the young people in the in the traditional process about how they experienced you know were they did they experience respect what did that look like was it fair why or not that sort of thing so that'd be the, that's the first level so if that looks like well we're seeing something that looks like a material difference ideally you would then um, you know d you have to do a longitudinal study at some point right but this is again it's like they never get there because hat back on I have to have enough that I can point to to suggest there's something here and you know a lot of people who are sort of interested in this general area would say yeah, everything you say is interesting enough but of all the things we can do why this one so that's you know right so that so there needs to be uh, a pretty strong case based on that sort of the original I think exper experiential reporting to just suggest there's something here that could turn into something that we would see um, if we looked longitudinally and then what you'd look for longitudinally is still uh, you know I, Eventually, again, sort of pie in the sky, it'd be fun to throw in recidivism rates too, but it would be, a lot of it would be looking at um, sort of how people describe their understanding of themselves and law and the like um, years hence. Yeah. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your concerns or that you may or may not have about group effects on these individuals? I think we're talking about how identity formation is a lot about what your peer group if they have a good experience and their four best friends have a really terrible experience because they're not in the program, to what extent does that compromise your findings? Good question. I don't know. I mean, I really don't know. I mean, it's a, you could, I mean, I think another way of saying this is it's clear that all the other experiences they have in life, and some of those are direct and some of those are indirect, will also have an impact, right? So the question is, if this is different enough and striking enough and meaningful enough, will it counter all the other things that sort of are, are pretty, pretty strongly pulling them in the direction of kind of validating what they already expected, which is I'm outside this process, right? I'm being treated in this process rather than included and responded as part of this group. So yeah, good question. Yeah. From a, I guess, a systems design perspective, do you think there would be any value in looking outside the criminal context to other I'll say quasi-judicial uh, administrative proceedings. Uh, I practice in social security disability, so we have social security uh, hearings for child disability cases or school hearings for IEP meetings, things like that. It seems like some of the procedural justice issues at least would be similar. Absolutely. Any process of decision making, particularly focused on this age group, is of interest and I think valuable. And then you just sort of think about what's different in the state, what do we learn from it? Um, but absolutely, I, I would say there's, there's no context that's not relevant to, in, in thinking about this. They just tell us different things, right? As part of, and when I, was, when, I, when I look to models, I try to look very broadly. Um, so if you have any particular examples, let me, let me know. Um, uh, because I, I think that just adds to the, you know, we don't have the particular yet, but we have a lot, you know, every, every, every um, other context that bears something in common will, will you know, give us some idea. I'm wondering what you think the role of the legislative process is and what you're trying to do. So I know you're identifying the judges as people who have great power um, uh, to affect the process. And I'm wondering what sort of things or what sort of policy can advocates try to go for in the legislative realm to make this process happen? Well, you know, the real pie in the sky, and then after the study, it's such a good idea, and then the legislatures make it happen. No, um, I think even now, there's a range of how much freedom judges have to try things and directions to some extent that those experiments are pointed and legislators can affect that. Uh, that's not where I'm focusing my energy because I think, you know, I, I, I would rather in a small, I know I can move forward on a small scale with individual judges and I think I'm more likely to be effective by starting to actually test something and then think about sort of next steps or let other people think about next steps to the extent that there are things like legislative advocacy that take their own set of skills. But it doesn't, for me, it doesn't strike me as a place to start. Um, it just seems like a, a, a less efficient way of getting to the same basis. No, yeah, get, getting to the same sort of test ground. But I mean, a legislature could say we want you know a change in model. You could you could have an implementation of a benchmark model. There's no reason a legislature couldn't impose that kind of structure. I just think that's it's premature to expect any legislature to have any reason to think that that would you know be how they what they'd want to advocate. Yeah. Question. I'm hoping you haven't touched on this yet, but um, so is there anything in your model currently that takes into account for, for example, if there's a juvenile defender or offender who um, is about to turn 18, but you want them into this in this benchmark trial, and you 
want the judge to continue meeting with right, right, right. Yeah. right. So, yeah. so what happens there? Um, is there any kind of like easing off of that um, that kind of model so that the day they turn 18, they're not immediately, you know, set out in the world without having finished this this program that they've started? Or well, this is this sort of ties in with the legislature. There actually is, you know, mostly determined by legislatures uh, a range of how long. Uh, how old court jurisdiction extends. So um, there's also, you know, there, there's actually a difference in age line in terms of where the age offense line stops, right? But, you know, happily, increasingly, it's 18, some states younger, but where you, you know, your offense committed before this, you're still eligible for juvenile uh, court jurisdiction. But then there's a question of how long you can stay involved in the juvenile court system for that offense that occurred earlier, right? And so, um, California goes allows all the way up to 25, although I don't think they, they, that is usually the practice, but a, a lot of states have embraced 21, which gives you a lot of room. So there's room between sort of when you would first be involved and that sort of the, they would give you that opportunity to continue that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. That, so then you can kind of graph on to whatever that. Right, but there, there, it's harder. I mean, some of the judges I've talked to, they're like, you know, it's an interesting model, but we may not be the right state because we ended 18. And it's like, you know, there's, there's less room. We could talk about 16 to 18. That's still a meaningful chunk of the right amount, the right sort of developmental time, I think. But it's nice to be able to um, have the possibility of involvement through early 20s. Yeah? Is there a reason that the model focuses on the role of the judge as opposed to a third party mediator? Oh, I made it this long. <laughs> third, third party mediator? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so a lot of the models outside of court look at somebody else. Sometimes there's a mediator type person. Sometimes there's actually remarkably not a single person, but a process that allows a group to deliberate. Um, the answers would be the following. First of all, you're in court. There is going to be a judge with authority. And that judge is either doing this centrally or it's going to become a satellite process, right? You go off to your mediator, you do your thing. And whatever, when that breaks down or to report or whatever, you go to the judge. So that's like, it's, it's attenuated. But more centrally than that, I think, if you're thinking about legal socialization and what we've learned from the procedural justice literature, the, um, the, law is, the, the judge is an embodiment of the law and the power of law in a way that I think is a meaningful part of the story. So it's not just a concerned person with sophisticated knowledge, you know, who, engaging, but the, the judge. The judge who's engaging, the judge who has these powers and has this role, I think is a huge piece of uh, the the social identity story. It's about you know this is this is the engagement. It's not any engagement. It's not just any concerned engagement. It's just not engagement on these topics. You could say probation officers kind of play that role now, the best ones, uh, but it's still this sense that there's something we do on the side. And then there's this thing that happens in court with the judge in charge, which I'm completely uh, removed from. Can, as soon as you're done with questions and comments, you can leave. I think that's how it works, right? Everybody else can <laughs> yeah, thank you.